All right. This is awesome. I don't know about you guys. This is like a Costa Rican jungle represent, right? It's awesome. So yeah, I'm, my name is Eric and uh, I suck at being normal. Just completely terrible at it. <laughs> yeah, some, some of you sounds like that's true too. So for me, it started in, in high school. I did terrible, got you know Fs. I was in the principal's office all the time, barely graduated. I uh, went to film school, which was fun, but you know, again, I dropped out, dropped out of film school. Uh, you know, anything typical just was not for me, which worried me uh, for a little while, especially when I was, uh, you know, couldn't find a job and was living in my dad's basement and even got kicked out of my dad's basement. I was like, I can't even do that well. So uh, I sucked at the time, but I realized it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because uh, I had one month, I had one month of rent paid in my apartment and I had to somehow figure out how to pay the next month's rent. And actually, that's how I got back into magic. I was just looking for a distraction, to be totally honest, and I started playing with a deck of cards. And I started inventing stuff. Kind of like some people will play video games or watch TV to just distract themselves from their lives. For me, that was magic. And then my creativity really came alive in creating these effects. And I started, um, you know, I went to film school, so I had a camera and a computer. And so I started filming some of these tricks. They, they were pretty cool, I thought. So I wanted to see if anyone else could figure them out. So I put them online on some magic forums and stuff. And people started saying, where can I buy that? And I was like, where can you buy that? I need to pay my rent, like uh, $10, you know? So I started burning DVDs and mailing them off to people. And I thought, this might just work. And very shortly after that, I get a call from Murphy's Magic Supplies, which is the world's largest magic distributor. And they're like, um, you know, is this expert magic? And I'm like, yes, this is, you know. <laughs> it was just like me in my bedroom, literally. And they're like, um, we want to order a thousand copies of this and a thousand copies of this. And, you know, and I was like, what do I do? You know, uh, I'm just a kid in my bedroom. I have no idea how to do that. Like, I don't know how to make copies. Like, I... I don't know what to tell you. And so they're like, well, if we sent you like, like what if we overnighted you a check for like $10,000, would that help? I was like, $10,000? That's more than I had ever heard of in my life at that point. So they did, and they, they overnighted, uh, overnighted me a check, and that was my first overnight envelope I ever got, and I never forget like peeling that open, sliding out the check with my name on it. I thought it was fake. I took it to the bank, like, I hope I don't get arrested or... This is like a TV show of some kind. Like, there's no way this is real. But it was real. And, you know, they, had, they put a huge amount of faith in me. And, and that was so meaningful to me that they believed in me. So that started me creating Expert Magic. And it was, it was really a gift because I was able to use my skills I had learned at film school and my creativity with other magicians to actually create, um, you know, a whole line of magic videos. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Yeah, right? Magic. Woo. So, um, yeah, so anyway, uh, it, it very quickly ramped up and it, it, it you know, reached this point where I was driving one day and my phone rang from a, a number from New York and I didn't recognize it and I answer and it was David Blaine who was like, you know, one of my idols and I was like, I had to pull over so I didn't crash, you know? And uh, so, you know, long story short, got to, got to work with him and his team and, and work on some really, really cool projects. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty high, pretty high on life at that point. And I was like, all right, it's time to level up. I want to do a, do a new project. My friends had seen what I had done. And they're like, we want to start a company too. So we started a printing company. And it went terribly. <laughs> it did not go well. The business was good, but the partnership was not. I didn't know it was like, like a marriage, but maybe even harder. You know, like I'm not married yet, but it, uh, it can be challenging having business partnerships. So it did not go well. And... Uh, we ended up, you know, really struggling with the partnership, decided to end it. Uh, my girlfriend and I at the time were like, okay, well, let's start a new company and then we can travel the world together. This will be great. And I thought, okay, this is good. My partners agreed to close down that company and roll it into to my new company. But on the final day, as we're getting ready to transition, they said no. They said, you know, we're not going to do that. You have to buy us out. Like they were going to force the issue. And I was like, you guys, I don't know, like I can't. So basically I spent all my money, like every savings I had, because I had hired employees and rented a space. And like those, I care about those people. They have 
families to feed and they, this is their job they're going to depend on. So I was like, I have to make this happen somehow. Um, so um, yeah, end up uh, spending all my money to buy out my partners and I um, find out the next day that there was unpaid debts and unpaid taxes amounting to total to $200,000. So I just bought this company and from my best friends who now were no longer my best friends um, for you know, with $200,000 of debt and I went home and my girlfriend who I was starting a new business with before I could tell her all this ended it. Broke up with me. <laughs> it was like a one-two punch, you know? And, and, uh, and flew back to the East Coast. So I'm like, man, like, okay, I, like, I have these employees at least. I need to, like, keep going for them. I moved out of my apartment. There was no way I could afford it. I moved into a tiny little spot. And uh, I woke up with all these bites, like bumps all over my entire body. And there was the, the place had bed bugs in it. <laughs> and I just, like, just started crying and just, like, fell into a puddle of, of Eric. I was just like, total puddle moment, you know? I think we've all had those puddle moments. Where you're like, I don't want to be an adult today. Screw this. <laughs> <laughs> so totally one of those moments. And then something really magic happened. I remember the last time I didn't know how I was going to pay my rent. I remember the last time I had like a, a puddle moment. And that was when all this magic happened, literally, with expert magic and, and everything that I created there. Uh, you know, my worst day was actually my best day. I just didn't know it yet, you know? I couldn't fast forward. So I, I sat up and I was like, man, I can't really get worse than this. So I'm going to like really go for it and really set some like really big goals. I've heard of this manifesting thing, you know? I'm going to try that out. So I literally wrote down like my fa you know, goals like, oh, I would like to meet, um, you know, uh, one of my heroes, Elon Musk. And I would love to drive a Tesla Roadster and travel the world, you know, taking landscape photography. And, you know, just like wrote down everything and just got to work on it. And I was like, the first thing I need to do is turn this business around. So I came up with uh, some new ways to price uh, printing services and how to package posters together. Found an investor and sold a piece of the company for $260,000. Like, and I'm talking like a week later, which is awesome. Yeah. And the coolest part about that for me was I now had a mentor and a business partner that I learned a lot from about how to actually have a, a good business partnership. So not, now the, it gets way crazier. Like two days later, I'm walking into a gallery in Boulder, Colorado, uh, talking to an artist about doing some photography for her. The gallery's not even open. There's like only four or five people in there. And this guy walks up to me and he goes, hi, I'm Elon. And I was like, I know. Yeah, you are. And I was so funny because I literally wrote it down, but I never really thought about what we would talk about. So it was like the most awkward conversation ever. But there's a friend of mine who's really into electric cars. So we're like texting him like, dude, Elon's here. You got to come hang out. And he, he comes and he's like, Elon, do you know about the Colorado tax credit? Because he knew all the laws about electric cars. And Elon's like, well, no, not really. I mean, they all have tax credits. He's like, Colorado's special. They'll pay the difference for the nearest car to any electric car so that it costs the same amount. So the nearest car to a Tesla Roadster is a Lotus Elise, which is $60,000. A Tesla Roadster at the time was $120,000. So I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the math here, but I sold the company a piece of it for $260,000, paid off the $200,000 in debt, and now it's $60,000, which I could use to buy a Tesla, drive it for a year, and then sell it for a profit at the end of that year, because it'd still be worth more than $60,000. So that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and I was just like, man, like this universe, like, hey, this stuff might work. This is crazy. But one of the most important lessons I learned there is that proximity is power. So the fact that, uh, you know, we had that conversation, that we were all in the same physical space is what created that opportunity. And that's what Do Lectures is. That's, that's what these events are about, is physically getting here in the rainforest, literally when it's pouring and all sharing that. So it's like, you know, it's not about getting some ideas here so that someday some magic can happen. The magic happens literally right here, right now with these people. So don't miss it, you know? Seriously. <laughs> so my other goal I had on there was to become like an international photographer and travel the world and all this stuff. So there's this camera that's like my dream camera and it's a Hasselblad, a digital Hasselblad. Hasselblad, some of you know this, yeah. 
so um, Hasselblads are like what they took to the moon, and like Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong took the pictures of the Earth rising and changed our perspective of what it means to be human on Earth. And um, so there's this camera that I wanted, and my business partner and another guy really love the Tesla, and they love the whole story of how it all happened and stuff, so they wanted a, uh, a piece of it. So we ended up sharing the Tesla, which gave me the funds I needed to buy the Hasselblad, which I did, and then I traveled the world for a year, just going all kinds of incredible places, meeting so many people. I went to Fiji and, and Argentina, and um, one of my favorite trips was um, starting in Barcelona and driving the whole rim of the Mediterranean. Just one of my favorite times in my life. Awesome. So I'm flying home from um, Grand Cayman in the Cayman Islands. And I started thinking about all this and I was like, this was easy, which is weird because it was really these really huge goals. And I was like, maybe, just maybe, the bigger the goal, the easier it is to achieve. Like, what if that was true, and like, how can I test that? So I was on this airplane just journaling about it, and I started thinking about this conversation I had with Buzz Aldrin underneath the Saturn rocket at NASA, which is a whole other crazy story of how that happened. But he was telling me about how all the astronauts have, when they see Earth from space, they have a spiritual shift. You know, they realize that this is our home, and not just that, but if we were scouring the universe to try to find like utopia or like heaven and we came upon Earth, we'd be like, I mean, we nailed it. Like there's dolphins and waterfalls and the food and like, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's just like we forgot. So I like to try to, you know, have my photography plant that seed. Like what if we're in heaven or utopia right now? Then it would be easy. We would all know how to like treat it right. How to, how to not ruin utopia, right? So I was like, how could I plant that seed in people's mind? How could I tell that story? How can I give that experience that astronauts have? And I was thinking about, well, if I could go to space, that'd be pretty incredible, and do abstract photography that's more about the emotion of that rather than purely photojournalistic, here's exactly what space looks like, right? So I write down this whole vision, and then this is kind of another piece of the secret sauce, is. Uh, my friends call it dumb action. So after you have some huge vision, you're like, what's the dumbest, like easiest thing that I can't fail at that I can try? Like calling someone, Googling something. And I wrote down to check Richard Branson's Twitter account. I was like, you know, he has a space company, that might be helpful. So as soon as the plane lands, I unlock my phone, check his Twitter account, and I see that he's gonna be in Miami in two days for the 15th anniversary of Virgin Atlantic flying back and forth. So I booked the ticket to Miami. Right then, it was like $200, I was like, worst case scenario, I'll have a fun story, and I'll get to go to Miami to the beach, you know? Um, and then I find out there's a charity event um, beforehand. And literally two days later, I find myself in the study at the Versace mansion in Miami, like the one, like with moving ladders, it was like straight out of book, like Game of Clue, all the books, everything. And I look around and it was a bunch of other hustlers, like just like the group here. And funny enough, I won't tell you who it is, but there's someone at this event that I didn't know was gonna be here that was in that room that night, so we can verify this story. So, all right, some more magic. <laughs> so yeah, we're in the Versace mansion and gonna meet Richard Branson, and then something crazy happened. I was like, um, I started feeling bad about it. I started feeling like, who am I to ask him anything? You know, Sir Richard Branson, like someone that I respect so much, I just kind of got my way here in two days, like, ah, I don't know if I'm gonna ask him anything, I'll probably meet him and that'll be fun. Um, but I don't know if I can really ask him to go to space. And then, yeah, something crazy happened. He, he came in and he was like, listen, he had us all sit in a circle and he said, listen, like the fact you got in this room matters. Like you are here for a reason and I wanna do whatever I can to help you with whatever you're up to in the world. And that like shook me to my core. I didn't know that someone could be like he was being, you know? And I thought highly of him before, and now I think of him, you know, I get why he is so successful. So we did, and we went around and we heard from everyone. And a lot of us that were in that room are still friends to this day. And so I gave him the pitch of a lifetime. I told him exactly what I told you about the Hasselblad and going to, you know, uh, eating dinner with Buzz Aldrin and talking about all this stuff and my vision. He said, you know, that's cool, but show me some of your photos, you know. So I showed him some of my photos, and I'll never forget, the second photo, he just ran me right to his assistant and said, 
let's do it, connect him to the team at Virgin Galactic. So they connected me with Virgin Galactic and I've been working with the Spaceport and Virgin Galactic about building a gallery at the Spaceport and doing this project. Yeah, so, <laughs> pretty sweet, pretty sweet. So, yeah, so I was definitely convinced after this that the bigger the goal, the easier it is to achieve. And certainly proximity as power was, was a piece of this. If I hadn't gotten there in person, there's no way um, that that would have been able to happen. So I, I really, really want to share and want to, you know, give people the tools to do this. You don't need it, but I created software called DaVinci, which is at DaVinciTime.com. And it's software, like, I don't know, I was kind of imagining what if we all designed our lives instead of reacting. I, luckily, I couldn't get a job, so I was sort of forced to do that, but not everyone has that. So anyway, that's, that's like kind of my passion right now. And, you know, I, I, I most definitely did not stop at space. I've done all kinds of crazy stuff since then, like uh, raising $16 million in three weeks, having two top 10 selling iPhone apps, um, and even like they mentioned learning how to fly fighter jets um, with a friend of mine. So um, this stuff absolutely works. And if you want to talk about anything that I've mentioned, I'm also working on Seasteads, all kinds of stuff. Proximity is power, like we're here right now. So I would love to, to talk to all of you about it. So remember, as we've learned, proximity is power. Come talk to me and, and that's my talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>